Well, welcome everybody to chapter 10 as we look about Saul and, and Samuel. The book of Samuel really begins what we kind of call a prophetic era in the Old Testament. You know, back in Numbers eleven twenty, the Lord had said, Oh, that all of the Lord's people were prophets and that his spirit would be upon all of them. During Moses' time, you remember people watched as Moses went up in the mountain and got all the words from God and came down. But as we see, as we move into Samuel, we see the Lord's desire to become much more up close, personal with his people. He wants them to hear his voice and sense his immediate guidance. And, and I think this is significant because I feel like we as a church are kind of entering a prophetic era where the Lord's emphasizing hearing and speaking fresh words from him. What we see when prophetic activity increases, God activity increases. At the beginning of the book, it says the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And because there was much, not hardly any of God speaking, there were very few miracles. But as the book progresses, God's activity comes everywhere. We see that with the prophetic word, uh, people's lives are dramatically changed. One of my favorite verses is in uh, 1 Samuel 10, 6, it speaks about when Saul, and it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, and he began to prophesy, and he was changed into a different man. <laughs> Something incredible happens when you learn to hear God and speak for God. The book opens with a woman named Hannah, who is in a desperate strait. She's barren. She feels ashamed. Her rival wife... Uh, of her husband is mocking her, and yet it doesn't seem like God is hearing her. And she then, and in desperate intercession, is crying out to God, and God switches her heart. Have you ever been in that place where, where God says, "I want to, I want to answer your prayer, but, but you're not yet in line with my heart." And He repositioned her heart, and suddenly she had a word. Oh, God wants me to have a child for His glory. So he, she promises to dedicate this baby to the Lord. And God answers her prayer. And Samuel is born. By the way, the, the name Samuel means, I heard from God. <laughs> and, and then, of course, she ends up having five more children. You know, once God starts aligning your life with him, he just starts to bless. And Samuel learns in those first chapters, even as a little boy, how to hear the Father speak. And he grows in that. I talked about this on Sunday because it's so important. Those famous words, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God raises him up, and not one of his words fall to the ground. And he impacts that nation tremendously because of his prophetic gifting. And he releases it to many others. Well, Samuel was a great leader, but in 1 Samuel 8, 4, when Samuel was getting older, it says, the elders came to Samuel in Ramah and said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Sadly, Samuel, just like his mentor, Eli, had not invested as much in being a prophet to his own family. And so his sons didn't follow in his footsteps. And it's just a warning to all of us, whatever God's gifted us as, our family is our first ministry. So they go on and they say to, uh, to Samuel, now make us a king to judge us like all of the other nations. This displeases Samuel and the Lord. Uh, the first reason is, you know, whenever we start to get our cues from the world, we're in trouble. Notice how the people say, we want to be like all the other nations. God didn't want them to be like all the other nations. He wanted them to be a special, peculiar people who were led by his voice. And yet their eyes began to become on what made other nations successful and cool. And I, I can't help but thinking of that stage in all of our life. Maybe as a teenager, we go through it and the peer pressure to want to sound like everybody else. 
And, and you, may be, you remember hearing your mom say something like, well, mom, everyone's going to that party. And she said something like, yes, and everybody's jumping off a bridge. Would you jump off a bridge too, you know? Well, here they are in that same phase, wanting to be like everybody else. And even as, as adults, this is still a real issue for all of us. We are all subtly seduced on a daily basis by advertisers, by the influence around us, to really give in to the pressure of following the crowd. The culture, the messages, uh, the way we should dress, the way we should think, the desire to have what everybody else has, the desire to keep up with the Joneses, you know, the, the mentality that says, well, we should watch the movies they watch. We should, we should have the same stuff that they have. We should be like this. And, and, and the Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world and don't be conformed. Uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This is not of God. You can't be like the world and be like Christ at the same time. And, and we need to examine our hearts. I know in my mind sometimes, just silly things, like I drive a, an old car and I'm thinking, boy, I sure, sure should have like a car on the commercial. I'd be awful cool then. Well, all the time, this idea of what is it the world wants us to be, how do we please people at work, must be guarded against. God did not want them to have a king. Why? He didn't want a level of management between him and his people. He didn't want a monarchy. He knew that they would be more likely to follow a king's ways than his ways, that a political system like the world would lead to layers of things that would take the agenda off of just hearing the voice of God and following God's will into doing what was popular or successful. That's what we see exactly what happens with a king. But God allows it. You know, God says to Samuel, go ahead and let him have a king. This is something we call the permissible, permissive will of God. It's not the perfect will of God, but God still sees the upper story and that he can fulfill it. And, and sometimes he allows us to go a lesser way, really to our own disadvantage when we choose to adapt a lesser than the perfect will of God for our life. But as a result, they find Samuel finds this one who's head and shoulders taller than everyone saw and recognizes that he is going to be the king. And you know, Saul is talented and good-looking and brilliant, but from the very beginning, we see the Achilles heel in his character, his insecurity, his ego. Um, one of the signs, I think it's so interesting, in 1 Samuel 10, when it's time to coronate uh, Saul as the king of Israel, Samuel calls all the tribes together, and it's sort of a ceremony, and he he calls each of the tribes one by one and goes through the family leaders. And he finally gets to the tribe of Benjamin and he calls out Saul. This is going to be Saul's moment. And Saul's not there. And nobody can find Saul. And this is his coronation. And the Lord speaks a word of knowledge to uh, Samuel in 1 Samuel 10, 21. He says, uh, Saul is hiding among the baggage. <laughs> he was in the luggage area. And they had to go find him and pull him out to be crowned king. But I think this is such an interesting telling picture of, of Saul. And it's a, it speaks to us about our own calling. Sometimes when we face the idea God is calling us to something, it's easier for us to hide behind our baggage. With the idea that we're going to be stepping up and God wants to anoint us, that reveals something to us. Well, we're going to be accountable now. And all of a sudden, our insecurities, our fear comes to the surface, our image, the sacrifices. And there is something in all of us that wants to go hide behind the baggage. Let somebody else do it. And I believe this is a great word for us today. God is saying, come out of your baggage and into your anointing. It's time to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to face those tough issues, 
because I'm not just another guy, another girl. I'm a person with a calling that needs to stand up and be anointed and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. Even if I feel unworthy, even if I have a reputation to deal with and issues, I need to start being the man of God, woman of God I'm called to be. In the next chapter 11, though we see a very positive side of Saul, uh, Nahash the Ammonite uh, leads an army against Israel. He captures a city and he has them very outnumbered. And, and so he, he calls the city leaders and so forth to negotiate a peace settlement. And basically he says, I'll, I'll make peace with you, but part of the agreement is I want all of the men to let us poke their right eye out. And again, the idea there is if you're fighting a battle and, and you don't have a right eye, you've got your shield here, you won't be able to fight in battle, so you'll be completely a victim. Now, what's incredible in the story is that many of the people seriously were considering taking that deal. And again, this reflects back to what I just talked about. How many people do you know who are willing to settle for bondage? They're willing to, because of intimidation and fear and insecurity, unbelievably sell out and say, okay, I'll accept a life of impurity, a dysfunctional family, an addiction. Okay, I'll just accept it's just I don't want to face the tough decision I'd have to make. I don't want to go into battle. I don't want the hard job of admitting that I've got a bondage and, and having to fight for freedom. So, so I'll just let my right eye be poked out and I'll live a sub-level life. But when Saul hears about what was going on, I love this phrase in chapter 11, verse 6. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul and his, he was aroused in his anger. And uh, I like this idea because he suddenly gets up, he cuts up an ox and sends it to the 12 tribes. And he says, hey, whoever doesn't follow me into battle, I'm going to cut you up like I did that cow. And so they do come together and they go into battle and they defeat the Ammonites. But here's the point I want you to see. Sometimes we think of Christianity as very passive. And many people believe that God's word says, don't get mad. When actually it doesn't say that. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and sin not. <laughs> you know? In other words, there's times that Christians are to get aroused in their anger and injustice and evil. Jesus, when he saw that the house of prayer, the temple was being taken over by merchandisers, he, he, he said, this cannot be. And he took a whip and he chased those guys out. And you know, God often calls us to what I call righteous indignation. In fact, one of the ways you know God is, is moving on your heart is that you see some injustice in the world and your spirit rises and says, no, 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 this cannot be. I was just hearing about Bono, how he's become so involved in world poverty and these things. And he went into a refugee camp in Ethiopia a number of years ago and saw the AIDS and the, the famine. And, and inside he said, no, no, no. All he did is shake his head the whole day. And he says, I will spend the rest of my life uh, doing something about this. Um, it's that idea, remember Popeye, and he finally can't stand it. He says, I can't stand it, and I can't stand it no more. And, and God wants to move our hearts that way. I can't stand the fact that there's a harvest and no harvester, Jesus would say, that there's sheep and no shepherds. I know in my own heart when I see these uh young people being raised sometimes by maybe a grandmother, their parents are prison and we have them in our church and, and about fourth grade, they're getting, they're leaving the church. I said, no, we've got to reach these kids. And there's something in your life that, that rouses your anger for, for God. You need to listen to that. God hasn't made us to be passive. He's made us you know, to be world changers. The Bible says the violent take the kingdom by force. And, and God's moving you in some area in that same way. Well, sadly, after this, things go really south with Saul. Uh, 
On two occasions, he completely distorts God's will. He, he refuses to wait for Samuel on one occasion to make the sacrifice, and he presumes on the priestly office and offers a sacrifice to appease the people. And then in chapter 15, the Lord through uh, Samuel commands him to execute judgment on the Amalekites for what they had done to Israel. He was to wipe out the entire people and their sheep, and God said, don't leave anything breathing. Well, Saul decides to do his own thing. He keeps the sheep, the best sheep and the cows, and, and keeps the king alive. And, and so Saul shows up, and in 1 Samuel 15, 15, it says, then Samuel went to, excuse me, Samuel shows up. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of the sheep? You know, this is just kind of ridiculous. Bless thou of the Lord, you know, Samuel. I've done exactly what you said. And, and, and Samuel says, but what do I hear? Bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> and, and what is the lowing of these cattle? And immediately Saul begins to rationalize. He says, oh, we just saved the best of the, you know, of the of the." sheep and the cows to sacrifice unto the Lord. We did this unto the Lord. And this is where Samuel becomes very upset. In verses 22 through 23, he says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Something here happens that God's big story can no longer be fulfilled through Saul. God is going to have to remove him now and find a man after God's heart. What is that thing? Well, Saul begins to rationalize disobedience. You see, God can deal with sin and failure. David's going to have plenty of it. But what God can't deal with is when we choose a path of self-rationalization and excuse, especially when we put a religious guise to that and pretend that we're serving God while really we're just following our own agenda. You know, the human heart has an incredible ability to rationalize our sins and our disobedience. One of the things I tell people is without a small group in which you diligently confess and talk about your motives and your issues, you'll, you'll easily become blinded to the fact that you have hidden areas of rebellion. And it's only by humbling ourselves and being accountable that those things get revealed and so that our hearts stay pure. Remember, Jesus will say to some on that last day, They'll come to Jesus, they'll say, Lord, Lord. He'll say, you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say. You have a rebellious heart. And what we see here is that it's so easy, even as we serve God, to keep the guise of being spiritual while still following our agenda. Being a true believer is not about what we say or how many times we go to church or whether we've got the bumper sticker on our car or whether we say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God, man. The real issue is, are we fulfilling God's agenda or our agenda? Sometimes we think, well, God wants me successful and blessed. Yes, but there's something he wants before that. He wants you to be faithful and obedient like Hannah was. Jesus could have chosen to call 10,000 angels, but he gave up his agenda to do the Father's will. That's what God has called us to be if we're going to follow him and we're going to fulfill his purpose in our life. God bless you as you discuss and learn from this important chapter. Amen.